Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I'm here today with Dr. Peter Kozlowski. As a functional medicine MD, Dr. Peter Kozlowski uses a broad array of tools to find the source of the body's dysfunction. He takes the time to listen to his patients and plots their history on a timeline, considering what makes them unique and co-creating with them a truly individualized care plan. Currently, he works with patients online and in person via his Chicago, Illinois, and Montana-based offices. Dr. Kozlowski did his residency in family practice, but started training in functional medicine as an intern. He trained in the clinics with leaders in his field, including Dr. Mark Hyman, one of my faves, Dr. Deepak Chopra, and Dr. Susan Bloom. So many great doctors to work with. And this was a power-packed interview, you guys. We talked all about the mind-body-spirit connection to your gut, your gut health, how to heal your gut, how to know if you have leaky gut and what to do about it, how to do an elimination diet and use his book and do like a FODMAP plan, as well as what type of fasting to do, intermittent fasting, 24-hour fasting. And we also just talked a lot in depth about how important your gut health is and great things to do to help make your gut be in alignment and balance and healthy. He also talked about issues you could have besides leaky gut, like SIBO, dysbiosis, so many things. It was so informational. And I love how he put it in terms, layman terms, so everybody can understand what he's talking about and how to better take care of their health such a great discussion today, you guys. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Koz, Dr. Kozlowski to the show today. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, gosh. Well, you are, you've just had this huge move. What prompted you to move from Chicago to Montana? Um, it was, I guess, a. Uh, um, it was always something I wanted to do. I wanted, so I'm born and raised in Chicago and I was always kind of interested in heading out. And last year we rented an RV for two weeks and just drove West and spent most of the time actually in Montana and just kind of fell in love. And while my wife was sleeping in the RV, I applied for a medical license out here and uh, she was down to move here. So uh, just kind of getting away um, from the city life and more into nature. Um, is is a big reason why behind it i really think like uh, i've seen this a lot even my daughter who's you know been living in manhattan in new york they moved out of the city too and i really think a lot of it has to do with what we've been through in this pandemic the last year wanting to just be out in nature because i think being out side and just being somewhere beautiful just takes you away from all of the fear and everything else we've been going through. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, what I care about most in my patient's health is mental, emotional and spiritual health and uh, living in the middle of the city, I, I feel like my mental, emotional, spiritual health was getting drained every single day and there wasn't a lot I could do about it. Um, whereas here I, I can go hike the mountains 15 minutes from home. And exactly like you said, it's just, there's the fresh air, there's the exercise, there's the freedom, there's the lack of fear, um, besides the bears that are in the mountains. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, it was a shocking move. Like if you would have asked me a year and a half ago, like, will you ever, uh, end up or live in Montana? I would have been like, no way. Um, I had traveled a lot in my life and, uh, all over the world, but I actually never even been to Montana. So, um, living here now, I mean, is, is quite the shock, but I feel like all of us have been through quite the shock in the last year and a half. 
Wow. So I've never been, I don't think I've ever been there either. I did go out West to Yellowstone and do all that. So I'm right outside Yellowstone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we ever did go through Montana, but it sounds intriguing. And I think we're all ready for a new life adventure about now. Yeah. So how has fear uh, impacted your patient's gut health during this time? Have you noticed anything different? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a spoiler alert with my book, um, Unfunk Your Gut. But the secret that I reveal to your gut health is it is your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And that's the gut brain connection, right? And your gut and brain are connected and they talk to each other. Your brain has this is the central nervous system. Your gut has its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. It has over 200 million neurons in it. These two nervous systems are connected by one of your cranial nerves called your vagus nerve. So you have this nerve that runs from your brain to your gut and back and forth that's sending signals both ways, right? And your vagus nerve runs on your autonomic nervous system, your automatic nervous system, which is in either two responses. It's either in sympathetic or parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. And the, the analogy I really like is if I'm hiking in the mountains and there's a grizzly bear, my sympathetic nervous system should be activated. The blood goes to my brain and my muscles so I can escape and save my life. The blood go is shunted away from my gut because that's not the right time to be focusing on digesting my food uh, when I need to survive. Rest and digest is sitting by the campfire at the end of the night and having a s'more or whatever you want to have and relaxing and digesting your food. Well, people, even before the pandemic, but it's definitely escalated the problem. We're living as if um, we're running from a bear 24 seven, basically. And I I'm guilty of this, but usually the first thing I do when I wake up is check my phone right? Well, that, that doesn't activate my parasympathetic. I'm not resting and digesting. It's like, okay, I have patient emails. I have uh, other emails, business emails. I've got texts, phone calls, then I'll go on the news. And obviously the news has been a lot more, I don't know. It's, I think it's always been fear-based, but they've, they've really been exploiting it for the last year and a half. For sure. And so the sympathetic nervous system's activated, right? Yeah. And then I sit down to have breakfast and I've got the news on, or I'm responding to messages, sympathetic nervous systems activated. So I'm eating food. So my gut's like, Oh, okay. I should be digesting. Your brain is telling your gut, Hey, don't, don't digest your food. So when that sympathetic response is activated, you don't make stomach acid. If you don't make stomach acid, the digestive process never starts. You can't digest protein. The rest of your digestive enzymes won't get activated. Your pancreas won't work as well. You, your bowels will move slower. And then all of us have three to five pounds of bacteria growing in our guts. That's called your microbiome. You, can, you actually can shut down your probiotics or your good bacteria from growing based on how stressed out you are. Wow. So, when I talked, I mean, I've talked about this with my patients from the beginning, but I now, cause people come to me for supplements, medication, or sometimes meds, testing, gut health, toxins, detox, healing, all types of autoimmune conditions, autism. But when I bring up mental, emotional, spiritual health, that's when like the huge red flags go up, right? Like, no, that's not an issue in my life that I don't know. <laughs> And I'm like, listen, you can't run from me because I can literally see it in your stool test. Like, I'll be able to tell you that you were stressed out in your microbiome. So you can tell just yeah, looking there's... at our, oh, wow. How, how so do the... you tell? So part of a stool analysis, which is how we look at your microbiome, is culturing out probiotics and then dysbiotic bacteria. There's three specific bacteria called Bifidobacterium, Lactobacillus, and Enterococcus that are suppressed. They won't grow when you're stressed out. There's a separate immune marker called secretory IgA 
if that's also in the tank, that means that that's all your sympathetic nervous system and vagus nerve. So, I mean, I see it all the time and now, I mean, I can show people so um, they, they believe me, but. I find that fascinating. So, what kind of test so, do you run for that? Stool analysis. It's called a comprehensive stool analysis. And you do this online? No. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I work with patients online. Like now, they could go to the lab. You could tell them what tests and they could like. We, we would people. ship the test to the, to the person. So you need like a doctor's order. We would order it directly from the lab. They send it to you. You poop and basically what looks like a French fry box, send, put it in a little tube and <laughs> send it to the lab. Well, um, it's all in, it starts all in the colon. I mean, in the gut and the colon are pretty important to your overall health. And I keep hearing a lot about, uh, like I'm working with Dr. Stephanie Estima right now. And of course for health practitioners and doctors um, so we can teach her method. And she talks about all of this that you're talking about today. So I feel like I'm getting a reinforcement course today. And she talks about how important it is, what you digest, absorb and transfer. Like, and I totally get that since I've started doing some of the things she recommended to heal my gut. And one of the things I have to say is, using the kale i saw that on your shirt on your book <laughs> <laughs> kale I, university <laughs> i have been taking kale um pretty regularly and it has really helped out in the elimination department let me say it is definitely yeah, yeah. an intestinal scrubber <laughs> yeah <laughs> And uh, so how do we tell if we're having problems with our gut besides a stool test? What are some other ways people can tell if they have leaky gut and what is leaky gut for everyone out there? Yeah, so that, that's besides the gut brain connection that probably brings up the other most important part of your gut health. So the gut and, and this anatomy, I've got it all drawn out in my book and stuff, because sometimes it's a little hard to just listen to it. So there's pictures to help. I, I like pictures, but the gut is a, the, is a tube that runs from your mouth to your anus, mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine connected are your pancreas, your liver, your gallbladder. It is a long tube with openings on both ends. Technically, the inside of your gut is outside of your body. If you eat something and poop it out, it's never been in your body. So the gut, the, the roles of the gut that people are familiar with are digestion and absorption, right? We break down our food, we absorb the nutrients into our blood. Well, the most important role is really for the gut to decide what comes in and what stays out. Because on the other side of the gut tube is the bloodstream. The bloodstream is inside your body and your immune system's in there waiting, hanging out and identifying good things and then eliminating bad things, right? So in your small intestine is where 90% of absorption happens. Your small intestine is lined with these things called microvilli. Small intestine is about 20 feet long, but there's 2000 square feet of absorptive surface. So it's a huge area. And when that system is healthy, we let nutrients into our body and we keep toxins out. When our guts are inflamed from eating too much sugar, too much processed food, fast food, stress, uh, environmental toxins like lead, mercury, mold, um, high cortisol, the junctions in your gut that should stay nice and tight open up. And then anything that's flowing through your tube can flow into your body. And that's what leak, what leaky gut is, is basically when those junk, when your gut barrier has lost its function, right. And it's just letting, it's like a bouncer that walked away and now anybody can get in. <laughs> anybody right? can come in. Right. So that, that's what leaky gut is. Um, in regards to, t how oh, do sorry, you tell? Ahead. How do you tell if you have leaky gut? Does your, your gut distend or how do people tell without a test? You, you wouldn't. 
Yeah, leaky gut is hard because there's not, and there's, I mean, I know there's different opinions in my field, but in my experience, there's not really a reliable test to diagnose leaky gut. So the way that I approach it is there's a couple markers in the stool analysis that can help, but the way I approach it is if you have one of the underlying causes of leaky gut, then you have leaky gut. And the real treatment for it is to get rid of the underlying cause, which is identifying food sensitivities through an elimination diet, treating dysbiosis, treating SIBO, detoxing, working on your mental, emotional, spiritual health. That's how you heal leaky gut. Um, overall, in my uh, experience, the best test for leaky gut is actually a food sensitivity test. So the most common thing I work with nutritionally is food sensitivities, which is different than allergies or celiac disease. But there's a lot of practitioners in my field that order food sensitivity panels where they draw your blood and you can check like 200 different foods that you might be reacting to. Those tests are typically just a log of what you've been eating for the last few months if you have leaky gut. So if somebody does a, a, a food sensitivity test and they've, they're basically showing up as if they react to a bunch of different things. And then you look at the list and they're mostly things they've been eating in the last couple of months. That means that your gap junctions are lost and those proteins are getting into your blood. And that's why you're getting this immune response. Oh, that so, makes sense. But I, I don't run that test to diagnose it. Like I said, the way I approach it is if you have one of these other underlying causes, then we're also working on leaky gut, but it's not something that you would ever feel like you would not like have abdominal pain. And it's like, Oh, my gut's leaky. Like it, it could present as eczema or a rash or migraines or joint pain or autoimmune disease. So it it's silent in regards to symptoms. Okay. Yeah. You, you can't see inside yourself. So you don't really know. What about bloating? Uh, is that a sign? So I, I wouldn't personally classify anything under a sign of, of leaky gut. Um, the most common um, condition that I work with in the gut is called SIBO, small yeah. intestine bacteria mm, overgrowth. Right. Um, that's basically your microbiome should live in your large intestine, but due to usually slow transit, constipation, low stomach acid, stress, antibiotics, the bacteria can move up into the small intestine. Mm. And the small intestine, like we talked about, is where you should be digesting and absorbing. Your bacteria are alive. Your probiotics are alive. You need to feed them to keep them alive. They, they eat fibers and sugars. So when you have SIBO, and when they eat, excuse me, they create gas. It's an anaerobic process. So if you eat a bunch of kale and you get gassy, that's because your microbiome's eating. That's a great thing unless the probiotics are living in the small intestine. If they're in the small intestine, then every, if you're getting bloated, like anywhere from like 10 minutes to an hour and a half after you eat, that would be a sign to me to test you for SIBO. If you're getting what 10 minutes after bloated 10 okay. minutes to, to two hours after eating, I, and you're getting bloated. Um, then especially with foods that are high in fiber, like prebiotic foods, like, yeah. uh, avocados, garlic, onions, some nuts and seeds, apples. Like if you're specifically getting bloated after foods like that, but really any kind of, if I, we were just to use the symptom of bloating, I would usually start with identifying food sensitivities through an elimination diet and then um, testing for SIBO. So with SIBO, mm -hmm. what type of like lifestyle and diet changes and can SIBO be caused from taking too much probiotics? In theory, it could, right? Um, and that, that's what I'm, I'm known as a gut doctor, but I don't ever really start anybody on probiotics because unless we do testing and we're treating something like candida or something else, but 
in the general public, um, like if you tell someone you have stomach pain, they usually tell you like eat more fiber and take a probiotic. That's great for a lot of things, unless you have SIBO, because then you're just feeding the problem and making it even worse. So I'm, I'm very cautious personally with probiotics. I mean, I, I've seen a number of patients that get better after seeing me just by stopping their probiotic and starting a low FODMAP diet. Um, so they, I don't know that they definitely would cause it, but I mean, like, like I said, anything can be a trigger for SIBO, stress, low stomach acid, constipation, abdominal adhesions, diabetes, um, potentially probiotics, like any of these things could be contributing to it. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the sponsor that we have, why I take their probiotic is because it's just fermented food. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be ref refrigerated. It's not like uh, some of these other probiotics on the market. And I find like doing Dr. O'Hara's probiotic, um, I don't get the same type of, um, mm, I don't know, like the, the things that I've heard other people experience when they're taking a ton of refrigerated probiotics. I like. I like to do that. And I like to do some, uh, sauerkraut that has probiotic in it, you know, like that's, fermented. yeah, it should be done through food for most yeah. people. Right. And that's why I like their probiotic. Cause it's all created just straight from fermented food. So I think, you know, that's people... actually my favorite probiotic is Dr. O'Hara. So if people want one, that's usually the one I go with. Cause it's the most broad spectrum. It, they've got, so many different species of bacteria in there. Whereas like the majority of probiotics just have two, they have bifidobacterum and lactobacillus and then a bunch of species within those. But Dr. O'Hara's probiotic actually has a, a little bit of everything. Yeah, and I so think it's important like for, for people out there to, to know not to just like to know what the good probiotics are and why they're good and not to just go grab a bottle off the shelf that they have no clue about. And yeah, most of them are useless. Yeah, so that that's very educational, I think, for everybody listening today. What type of lifestyle changes and diet changes do you have people go through to heal their gut? Step one in the overwhelming majority of people is an elimination diet which is how you diagnose food sensitivities. So I mentioned the food sensitivity testing earlier. The real way that you test is through a 21 day elimination diet. That is because everything in your body has a half-life. So if you take prescription meds, if you uh, drink alcohol, your hormones, everything has a different half-life, how long it takes us to clear things. That's why some meds are taken four times a day. Some are once a month because there's a difference clearance time. If you have a sensitivity to food, you create something called IgG or well, something called IgG antibodies attack the food, right? So let's say gluten gets in your blood. It's been genetically modified. It looks different than it used to. Your immune system attacks it. Now you've got an immune complex and that's creating a food sensitivity, right? Let's say I do react to gluten and I had a bagel for breakfast today and I have a hundred antibodies floating around right now. If I don't have any gluten for the next 21 days, my immune response will cut in half to 50. On day 22, I eat the gluten again. If my immune system remembers the gluten as being a problem, it will attack and I will get symptoms. So you use a tracking journal to step-by-step -step diagnose. So you introduce one food every two days. Um, so in my book, we have that tracking journal. We've got over 50 recipes. Today is like day uh, nine for me on an elimination diet. I usually do one uh, every year. Um, so the foods that we cut out are gluten, dairy, soy, corn, eggs, sugar, beef, pork, shellfish, coffee, alcohol, processed meats. Um, and then, so at the end, starting on, when I get to day 22, 
I'll start adding them back in. So on day 22, I'll do, let's say dairy. I'll wait day 22, 23, if nothing happened, then I'll do my next food that I miss the most. The order doesn't matter. Huh. So that's pretty cool. That yeah. is a huge, that's a, that's a, the easiest first step. And I mean, that's a great way to heal yourself without even needing a practitioner. And that's kind of why I try to make it so clear in my book on how to do that. Um, the other thing that I mentioned though, is a lot of times people that start elimination diet can actually get worse. Uh, and a lot of times the cause of that is SIBO because okay. when someone Makes starts sense. an elimination diet, they're eating more pre and probiotic foods, right? Mm -hmm. And that's feeding your problem. So in my book, the, the diet that we introduce is called the cause plan, which is an elimination diet that is also low FODMAP. So at the bottom of every recipe, we list how to change the recipe to make it low FODMAP to also treat SIBO. So it, it gets very complicated. I think it sounds awesome though for anybody out there that suffers with this problem to have you guiding them through in a book. Uh, that's almost getting more than they might get from a doctor visit, really. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, my initial visit always with my patients is, is usually an hour and a half, sometimes up to two hours, but the whole first visit is just education. Like it's just me. I have a PowerPoint that I go through and, um, I basically put all of that knowledge and experience into my book. And so now like when patients are calling to see me, um, cause we just put the book out, it's been like two months, but people that have already read it and they're a new patient, we're kind of skipping the initial visit and we can just get into testing and we can get into the, the specifics. Whereas for people that haven't, I mean, there's so much that I think our greatest job as physicians is to educate. And um, a lot of the functional medicine books, I, I think are hard to read if you're not a scientist, even if you are, it yeah, can be difficult it needs to, to read. Be in terms that, that people that didn't go to medical school can understand. So that's the way I wrote it. I'm a, yeah. I'm pretty laid back and I try, and I always try to keep everything simple. So I feel like my book is, is, I mean, there's a lot of science in it, but it's also, um, pretty, it's so easy to read. I've been, I've been leafing through and reading. And that was one of the things I'll have to compliment you on because I have a lot of doctors on the show and I've taken a lot of courses and worked with a lot of doctors. And I think that uh, it's important when you are trying to convey information to an audience that you're speaking in a language that they can understand. Of course, they want to know that you know how to say right. all the terms and that you understand, but it's important that they can absorb the information. And many times I think like with all of the terminology that they may have never heard, it's almost like they're ha they, you're talking over their head and they yes. can't grasp the information because of it. I totally agree. And that, that, that was one of my goals when I started my book was like, I, I want this to be different. I don't want it to be like every other science book. And I qu quote so many articles in there. So it's research evidence-based, but at the same time, like I tried to make it just understandable because once people can understand it, they can start healing. Yeah. Um, 100%. And, and then like one of my favorite parts is the recipes were written by a former, I guess, former slash current patient of mine who came in uh, with rheumatoid arthritis and she's been in remission for over six years now. She was, she's a chef. And so when I started writing my book, I reached out to her. I was like, Hey, can you write recipes? Um, and she wrote not only the recipes, but also she wrote a little blurb of what it was like to come in to see me how much her head was spinning, like the, the logistic, like just understanding. Cause it's like, it's not easy, especially if someone comes without their spouse or partner and they come home and they're like, okay, we're cutting out these 12 foods. And it's kind of like, why? So, um, I feel like that's also helpful is just like her human experience of coming in to see me. Yeah. And I think that's perfect because I was just getting ready to ask you one of your success stories. Did the uh, elimination diet 
and doing all of that then help her with her rheumatoid arthritis? Exactly. So, you know, in almost every chapter, I, I do give a case study um, from everything from autism to infertility to gut issues to autoimmune disease. So I used patient stories um, to kind of explain and also like detailed like what they came in at complaining of what doctors they had seen before, because usually I'm someone's like 12th or 20th option. I'm usually the last option. Usually they've been to Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic and they're like, I'm not getting anywhere. So screw it. I'll try this. Um, so I try to include, because that's a common story. I mean, I've run all these lab tests. My regular doctor keeps telling me I'm normal. Everything's fine. Gave me an antidepressant. And then it's like, we order all this toxin testing or gut testing and all this stuff comes back positive. And it's like, you're not actually crazy. Um, there's a reason all this stuff's happening. Um, so I do, I, I agree. It's really important. So I did try to share some of those diff. I mean, I, I've worked with con every kind of condition. So, um, I do think it's like so important that you're listing the conditions because there's so many people that are looking for the answers and you're not going to find that. I hate to tell you in a regular medical practice, usually, um, because functional medicine is so different from regular Western, you know, medicine. Can you explain the differences to everybody so they understand the yeah. different approach from what you do to a traditional medical yeah. practitioner? So, I mean, I was trained as a family practice doctor. So I went through like regular medical school, regular family medicine residency. Um, and Basically, the way we're taught in the traditional medical model is we're taught like the anatomy, the biochemistry, the physiology, how everything works. Then we're taught how everything can go wrong. And then we're taught what medications fix each thing that goes wrong. In functional medicine, we're taught to listen to someone, plot out their story, think of their life on a timeline, identify what things triggered, continued their disease, et cetera. And then instead of thinking of like, what pill am I going to give you to feel better? We're thinking about what does your body have too much of and what does your body not have enough of? And by balancing those things, the disease will heal on its own. Because in the majority of people, all these chronic diseases that are just escalate, escalating in frequency, um, it, the one consistent over the last 40 years during this increase in all these chronic diseases is everything that we're doing to our environment. As we damage our environment, we damage our gut, we become more toxic. And now all these weird diseases are just popping up everywhere. Um, so it, it is figuring out what caused or triggered the disease, eliminating that so you can heal versus a, a one analogy that a lot of people use is like regular medicine is like a band-aid approach. Like you're just putting a band-aid onto a problem. And a lot of times they're not thinking of all the side effects that other systems that are being affected because of the one thing that you are treating. And then you get um, another story I go through is like somebody that starts with migraines and then they get um, pills for the migraines. Then they get stomach symptoms from the pills they're taking for the migraine. So then they get an acid blocker and then their gut's a mess and then they're told they're crazy and they end up on an antidepressant, right? So this whole thing escalates um, because nobody's look, the regular medicine's not looking at why. The root cause of why yeah. you're having this imbalance. And if you heal the imbalance, then you're getting to the root cause of the symptom, right? Your body yeah. is just like giving you a message that something is not balanced. Yeah. So how important then, because it's just the whole mind, body, brain, gut connection, uh, are our emotions, the stress that we're going through. And also like in your book, you said trauma is anything less than nurturing. So how does this all play out in what's going on in with our gut health? Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, it's the most important part of our health and trauma is a big thing uh, 
is my is a big thing in my own story but um my in the majority of people i've worked with for the majority of us it starts when we're kids right and so yeah i do love that definition trauma is anything less than nurturing and so let's say you've got a child that comes home from school and they want to show off their homework or what happened during their day but dad's cooking mom's working nobody's paying attention and so the the thought is i'm not good enough right and we start escalating that thought and we start convincing ourselves i'm not good enough well that's going to put us into that sympathetic response shutting down our gut and then we're then we get an earache we go to the pediatrician they give an antibiotic well now my gut's already leaky from not feeling good enough antibiotics now wiping out the rest of my microbiome, SIBO, candida, dysbiosis, all these things can overgrow. So, and I've seen people, I mean, it could present in the teenage years, right? Like the trauma could be when you're five, the trauma could be, or, and the, the disease might not present until you're 15, 25, 45, 70. Um, the gut is shut down and eventually all these exposures that we're being exposed to creates enough damage, enough toxins get into our body and disease starts. So my own story is like my, my parents are immigrants from Poland and I grew up so first generation American. I never felt like I fit in. Like my obsession in life was trying to fit in. And it, a lot of it was diet, right? Like my friends would come over to my house and we'd be eating like sauerkraut and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd go to their house and they're we're having pizza and burgers and salad with ranch dressing and, and grilled cheese. <laughs> and so that's all I wanted to eat because right. it, it made me fit in. And it's funny because, I mean, I always, I did fit in. I had lots of friends. I was popular, whatever, but inside I never felt that. Right. right. I never felt like I did never felt good enough. Um, so when I started going to therapy and all of that, and they were telling me, you know, you've got trauma. I was like, no, I don't like, I've had a good life. I'm fine. Like I have some issues, but I'm, I'm okay. And it, but it wasn't true. And like, it was like embarrassing a little bit. Cause it's like trauma. You think of somebody that's exposed to like violence or something like that. Like, mine was created in my head. And that kind of trauma to me is almost even more difficult to work on because it's, you know, the, the, the story first step you're telling yourself, right? Yeah. The first step in re like recovery is to um, identify there's a problem. So somebody that's exposed to violence, it's like a lot easier to tell someone like, Hey, I've got trauma. Whereas me, it's like, I, I felt like people would look at me and be like, what are you talking about? So when that happens, and that's not everybody, um, it could happen in older age, but in a lot of us, it's when we're kids. Mm. And that just shuts down our gut. And then disease happens later down the road. I just think you are so right on about that. How did you heal the, the story of feeling like you're not okay, and you're not enough? Like, how did you heal that then in your, your head? I'm still working on it every day. <laughs> so the, w the way I healed it when I was really young was alcohol. And so I ended up in a rehab program for alcohol. So alcohol kind of took away all my insecurities and fears and all of that stuff. And then when I tried stopping, I didn't really know how to manage life without it. So I I've been in recovery for a, a long time now. And it was through that process of that that's the interesting thing about recovery. It wasn't at all about alcohol. It was dealing about my trauma, my insecurities, all of that. So the feelings you didn't want to feel. Yeah. I went into treatment like, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know I had emotions or feelings. Yeah. Like, I, they asked me identify like how I'm feeling and I had no clue. And I was 28 years old. And so I've been on it. And then the reason I say I have to work on it every day is because I've uh, stopped working on it and everything just comes right back. No matter mm -hmm. how much work I've put in, right. if I don't work on it every day, it, it comes back. And a lot of times worse than even it used to be. So for me, I mean, 
mental, emotional, spiritual health is something that all of us need to work on forever. And it's finding what things work for you. So exercise, gratitude, prayer, meditation, therapy, those are all things that I do on a regular basis to kind of help and keep me in check. How do you think practicing gratitude helps you with like aiding your digestion and getting in good gut health? Because it can, it can flip that switch from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Like I can be extremely anxious about a work call or something that just happened. Um, but then when I just start thinking, it's almost like the thinking positively is like, well, I'm grateful that, you know, I have a roof over my head or I had shampoo in the shower that my toothbrush is there. Um, it could be really small things. Sometimes it's big events, but a lot of times just that realizing like, wow, there's actually a lot of good things happening in my life can just calm me down right which lets my right. gut it, it flip, you're right and and that was a perfect analogy that it just flips that switch i i just find when your mind is going off on a negative train if you can find a way to reframe a negative thought with a positive you're flipping the switch mm -hmm. and it's just like a, a whole different world when you're focusing on the positive rather than the negative exactly what are some of the uh, things that you have people do for a daily routine that helps to benefit their mental, emotional, and spiritual health? Um, so the, the big thing that I encourage is we all kind of have to find our own path in that regard, in regards to different things work for different people. So I mentioned some of the things that work for me. There's evidence behind like meditation right for activating your parasympathetic response um so that's something that everybody could try i every patient that's ever met me i've recommended to get a therapist for mental health because they're the ones that help us figure out what's going on um i i love the gratitude list i mean i prayer works for me really well i have to exercise like i i had a spasm in my back uh two weeks ago and i couldn't exercise for a week and like my mental health went down the drain, but some people it's like they too much exercise is the problem, right? So you have to <laughs> actually cut it back, right? I hear you on that. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's really just like step one in my recovery. I think it's in any kind of recovery is identifying there's a problem. So if you can recognize like, okay, I have trauma, like I've had things happen to me. You can never unknow that, right? So you can choose to mask it, not deal with it. But if you face that, then you're going to find ways to heal from it. The body knows. And right. that's the thing. You think uh, you, if you don't deal with it, it you, you know, by avoidance, it's going to go away, but it's going to find its way into the body somehow. And I know when my fitness competition coach would always be asking me my stress level. I was always saying zero, one, zero. And the, so like, I was so disconnected yeah. from what my stress level really, really was. And I think that that's an important, you know, fact for people to recognize that they probably are disconnected too, as well from knowing like they're used to dealing with that stress all the time. So they don't even realize and recognize it as stress. So I think one of the most important things people can do is to name the stress and then go from there. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because in, in my, my patients that come to see me, they fill out an intake questionnaire that's like 40 pages of medical history. But one of the questions on there says, do you have an excess amount of stress in your life? And it's either a yes or no. And if the answer is no, that I know the person's got a problem. I mean, <laughs> like 1% of the time that turns out to be true, but that's like just checking off like, okay, I'm in denial, especially in the last year and a half. I don't, I mean, unless you're the top 1% that's getting richer and richer and they probably have stress too, but mm -hmm. the rest of us are struggling. Um, so that's my best screening question is if you answer no to that, then there's definitely an issue. So I think getting in touch with that and then following some of the tips that you've given, um, 
to, you know, to get on a good routine for your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. What are some of the most common toxins that you find in people when you're doing all these tests? The two main groups that I work with are heavy metals, mm. lead, mercury, cesium, yeah. thallium, um, and then mold mycotoxins. Oh my gosh, you're speaking the language. Oh my yeah, gosh. So I, I'm known for gut health, but I do just as much detoxing from those things as I do gut health. And yes, my next book one day will be all about toxins and hormones and things like that. But there's other ones like glyphosate. You can test people for non-metal toxins, things like organophosphates, vinyl chloride, thing, benzene, things like that. But the two ones that there's just a huge amount of exposure to that people don't know are heavy metals and mold. Yeah, the heavy metals and mold, that's huge. I could, <laughs> I could tell you two major stories about that. But uh, what do you use to help people then besides diet, do you use anything to help them detox that out? Oh yeah. Um, so I actually take people through oral chelation therapy okay. to, to get the metals out of your body. Right. Um, you that's for heavy metals for mold. It's a combination of, uh, one of the best things you could actually do is infrared sauna. Um, oh, good. I have one <laughs> sauna, um, supplements and medications and, Detox for people like, I mean, like our one exposure source of lead is uh, airplane exhaust, right? Mm. So uh, a mechanic from O'Hare that I was working with had one of the highest levels I've ever seen. He might be detoxing for a few years to get that stuff out of his body. Oh my God. Most of us, it's a lot milder. Um, but yeah, so I, I definitely use medications, supplements, interventions, in, in my opinion, if you've got like a, a lot of lead or mercury in your body, diet is not going to do anything. Um, you're, ne you're never going to touch that. So, so what do you use? Like zeolites or uh, Corella? DMSA. Or... <laughs> what? DMSA. It's oh. a key chelating medication. So okay. you get it from a compounding pharmacy and it literally pulls toxins out of your body. Oh, that's, that, that, that's chelation therapy. Yeah, because I know it's more dangerous to do it. Uh, there's some ways that can be a little more dangerous, like. Um, you that, definitely have to be careful with it. Yeah, you have to, yeah. There's a certain plan that we usually follow to make sure that we yeah. don't have issues. Yeah. Wow. This is so interesting today, but it is really important. I mean, for your metabolism, for your brain health, for everything, just to know not to be, of course, around toxic mold and exposed to it. And also, um, having heavy metals long-term, uh, you know, I had mercury hot, heavy toxicity, uh, to very high levels of mercury because, uh, they used to put fillings under the gum and yep. it was just leaching into my bloodstream, sulfuric mercury. And I would say to my husband every weekend, I feel like I'm being poisoned and I didn't know what it was, but I just, I just felt horrible. And we, when we finally discovered it, I had a, a biological dentist take them out. And um, she told me her story. And I guess because she was always dealing with fillings, uh, she used to just be like a dental assistant before she went to go become a biological dentist but she got all this toxic mercury in her system from handling the fillings. And then her, mm -hmm. her unborn child. Yeah. It uh, passes through the placenta. Yes. And oh my gosh. Um, I think like she had to have like her spleen removed, like all kinds of awful things with the child. So once they discovered the issue, it totally changed her life. And that's why that's what she does now is, is um, takes out the, the metal in your mouth. Nice. So it's, I, I know that it can be a serious thing. And uh, yeah. so I'm glad that you help people to get rid of all this toxicity within. And you also help a little bit with, with their diet. You talked about the elimination diet, the FODMAP. What about intermittent fasting? How can that help and is it effective long-term, do you think? 
Yeah. So Mondays and Fridays are my fasting days. So I'm fasting today. Um, and I do 24 hours twice a week. Um, there's so many different variations of it. Um, the main point, and I don't, I don't do it for most people are doing it for weight loss. I'm doing it for hormones, um, and brain health. Um, and it's good for my mental health. Whenever I finish a fast, I'm like, all right, I made it. Um, you feel euphoric, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but I, in my opinion, the reason intermittent fasting doesn't work for a lot of people, because I've heard that story a lot is like, it didn't work. They don't do it long enough. So most, a lot of intermittent fasting plans are just 16 hours. Gluconeogenesis, yeah, yeah. which is when your body's using its stored uh, energy yeah. to make active energy, doesn't really get going to like hour number twenty. Mm -hmm. So that that that's why I think you have to extend it. Some yeah. some people I have doing thirty six hours twice a week, um, but I, I I'm very pro uh, fasting um, for a number of reasons. Well, there's the statistics and all the studies are out there to just prove how how many, I mean, it's so many benefits. You're actually giving your body a little bit of a break so it can, so it can repair. And, yeah. um, I, I, I'm a big fan of fasting. Um, uh, I personally do better doing a 24 hour fast than I do the intermittent. I do much better with a 24 hour fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just think to each their own, I think right. you have to kind of uh, individualize it and uh, play around with the different windows of fasting and see what works for you. But do you do bone broth when you're fasting or what are some of the ways things that you do when sometimes you're actually... I do, I do juicing. Okay. Um, so I'll have a green juice or watermelon juice or celery yeah. juice. Um, I don't do bone broth as much personally. I just like juicing better. Um, yeah. So it'll either be a, like juice fasting or it'll be just like water and right, right, right. Coffee, water, you know, water, coffee, just tea. pure water, right? Yeah. Cleans you yeah. out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I really like the whole idea of doing that, the fasting as like a part of your self care. Yeah. Yeah. This has been such a great conversation today, and I've really enjoyed all of your information on our gut health. Uh, where can everybody get your book, name it again, and find you on social media? Um, so my book is called Unfunk Your Gut, and it's funk with a C, uh, which stands for functional medicine. Um, in my practice, we used to say, we still say we put the funk in functional medicine. Um, so unfunk your gut, and it, it's available anywhere. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your independent bookstore can order it if they don't have it in stock. So uh, there's a link on my website, uh, which is doc-cause.com, doc-koz.com is my website. And then social media is doc underscore cause, K-O-Z, um, which we've been posting a bunch of the recipes lately that are from the book and just delicious. So perfect. And can people reach out to you if they want to possibly Absolutely. work with you online? Okay, great. Yeah, the, the, the best way is uh, just off my website. You can email or call my assistant, Jasmine. She's phenomenal. She'll talk anyone through the process, figure out how to start, where to start. And uh, yeah, so that would be the best way is just through my website and talking to her. Um, it, we can definitely help people. Well, thank you. And that's perfect. And I really enjoyed every bit of our interview and I love your book. I love how it's laid out in layman terms where uh, people can understand how to better take care of their gut. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. And bye everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sisterhood of Sweat. <laughs>